Hey everyone, welcome this week to The Weekly. This is your stand-in host, Patrick Sebecki. I'm hosting while Jay is on sabbatical. He is going to be gone until the end of the summer, and we are going to be here with you still. So, I'm here this morning with Perry Marshall, who is one of the preaching pastors over here at the Boulder campus. Say hi, Perry. Hello, everyone. Perry, it's really great to have you here. I'm just excited this summer for the weekly to have a little bit more of a Boulder flavor as we talk to you yes. and Tom and John and the rest of those that preach here at the Boulder campus. Mm. It's just a sweet opportunity to be able to talk more and more. Jay and I shared last week just how the vision of the weekly is we get to come in Monday morning and hang out around the water coolers and just talk to you about all the great thoughts you were able to share on Sunday and then all the great thoughts you weren't able to share on Sunday because you only have so much time. Yeah. So I'm really excited to be here and get to talk to you about your sermon from this last week. Great. What about the thoughts that I wish I wouldn't have shared on Sunday? (laughs) <laughs> Does that, is that included too? Yeah, always. You can share that. Okay. We, we're a proud, a proud place. Apologize for the things that I shouldn't have said. <laughs> hey, one of my favorite authors that I've mentioned even a couple times being on the weekly, Augustine, near the end of his life, wrote a book called Retractions. Nice. And it's one of my favorite yeah. things. It's like, oh, what is it? What does it mean to actually go back and be humble enough to apologize? Yeah. So. Thanks, I'll, I'll write a book called Whoops, and nobody will read it, but at least I'll have it on file. Yeah, you'll be able to say you did it. Yeah. That's what matters. Sweet. Well, we're so glad to have you on. And Perry, this last week, you were teaching from Daniel 3. And I was even talking to my life group about how this story of the golden image and the fiery furnace is one that's so common to so many of us. It's yeah. one we've heard a lot. It's one we've seen a lot whether it's in rack shack and benny oh yes it's honestly not growing up watching <laughs> veggie tales i had seen that <laughs> veggie tales so i and just really enjoyed your message and oh, was thanks. just wondering you talked a lot about what the golden image for us was today um and you really got into this idea of human identity yeah. as the golden image that our culture around us wants us to comply to. So I was wondering if you could just clarify, maybe define that a little bit and uh, tell us where you see that in your life. Yeah. I, I don't think that the golden image is only one thing in our culture today, just to be clear about that. I think there are man, numerous things that it could be like for us today. But when I was just going through this text, that's the issue that stood out to me more than anything. Like, I don't, I don't know how you can escape the conversation about human identity these days. It's in the headlines. Um, for me, particularly, since I have two kids in high school and a seventh grader, I'm hearing conversations just at the dinner table about human ident- identity all the time. And... And, you know, just to to throw things back on you for a second, Patrick, I know student ministries at Calvary has done an excellent job of acknowledging that, identifying that, and then um, talking about it, addressing it. And that's been really cool, too, just to know that it's not something that's that, like in this case, only happens from the pulpit on Sunday morning, but it's something that students are also getting a good dose of help with through student ministry. So that's like awesome for us um, as parents to be able to know that, but it's just an inescapable issue. And so it's top of mind for me. And when I was reading this text last week and the week before in preparation, I just couldn't help but see some pretty amazing parallels between the way the chapter unfolds and the way I've seen this issue play out in our own culture. Man, thanks so much for sharing that. I mean, it's something, yeah, we see it all the time. Felt like in student ministries, if we weren't talking about it, we weren't actually talking about the things that mattered most to student, to Mm. students and what mattered the most to their friends and to the people around them. So it was, it was sweet to see you on Sunday morning, really diving into that. If you could give a quick, which is 
so unfair because scholars have written books that are a thousand pages long on this topic. Yes, they have. But if you could give a quick picture of what you mean when you say this issue of human identity, what would you say? Yeah, so uh, the best way that I can describe it, and this is not original with me by any stretch, because I have had the opportunity to read some of those um, pretty lengthy books, and um, they're tough to get through. And for me personally, like um, I've had to go back and reread some of the things that I have been introduced to because the issue can be kind of complex. But um, I've been helped the most probably by Carl Truman, um, who he's he's writing a lot these days. And, um, I know he, he wrote a, um, he wrote a pretty lengthy book in recent years that, um, he kind of then condensed into a more user-friendly version recently. Um, but what, what Truman gets at is his, his basic thesis. And I, I don't want to misrepresent him. So I want to be careful how I say this, but his basic thesis is I understand it to throw the caveat in there is that these things that seem so sudden in our culture, these changes that have happened that seem like they just almost have unfolded overnight are really things that have been developing over the past, certainly decades, but even longer than that, the um, centuries that have been at work and introduced through various philosophers and have culminated in this moment that we are in right now. So things that seem so sudden are really not quite as just immediate and um, overnight as we might think they have been. It's just that they've all kind of culminated in this moment and um, come together to bring us to the place that we're in in our culture. So that has been helpful for me. And the just to describe then the basic thing, it's um, and there are a series of different moves, but the first kind of move is that we have instead of been instead of looking to theology. Um, for our understanding of who we are in terms of our identity, who God has made us to be. When you take God out of the equation, then you just have the question, who are we? And if you don't have the reference point, an external reference point in theology, that God has made us in his image, God has made us male and female, then it's up for grabs to, for us to try to determine who we are. So I think in, when I was preaching on Sunday, I used the language of just self-determined identity. So, um, and some of these guys who have written these uh, pretty heady books have used the language of psychologizing. And so psychology has kind of usurped theology and even biology. So now it's no longer this objective kind of standard outside of ourselves that tells us who we are. Um, and strangely enough, you know, even our bodies don't tell us who we are anymore, but psychology is telling us who we are. And that's not to um, throw any shade on psychology as a field, but it's to say that we've looked internally to our own thoughts, our own feelings to determine who we are, which is a scary thought to me because of the simple fact that my thoughts, my feelings shift all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just a frightening thing to think that we would take something like our body and we would relegate it to a secondary source of our identity and instead put our feelings in its place. But even bigger than that, that we would take theology. We would take our understanding of God and God's word, and we would put that um, while we would remove it entirely from the equation altogether. Mm. Yeah, I. that's so helpful. I think one of the things that even struck me, how you connected it to, even if we disagree with this, but part of this movement, part of this idea of human identity is that people are saying that not only am I going to identify with the way I'm feeling, but also that identity requires an outward social acceptance. Right. So that that's how it extends of okay, this isn't just someone in their own life doing their own thing, but it's actually expanding out that pressure to everyone they come in contact exactly. with. Yeah, and that's that's where I, again, was helped by Carl Truman, and I, I included a quote when I preached, and there's a little bit longer version of it here that just says our satisfaction and meaning, like our authenticity, which if you've 
noticed, you know, authenticity is a definitely a buzzword in our society and our culture. And maybe especially among younger people today, authenticity is really important. And I think it's kind of a reaction against uh, what they have perceived in other generations and other times as being less than genuine representations of our true thoughts and feelings. So in that, in that regard, it can be good. It can be positive to say that, well, we, we really want to be real with each other. But that quest for authenticity um, has just resulted in some things that maybe aren't so good. So now there's this inward turn that we've taken and um, the, the quote from Truman says this, there's an outward social dimension now to my psychological well-being that demands others acknowledge my inward psychological identity. So he's just, uh, he's just looking at this, this inward turn, again, the psychologizing of ourselves where we are looking at our feelings. It just manifests in this outward turn where I feel compelled to announce to the world around me who I am because I've, I've decided it, I've determined it, and now I require you, I demand you to celebrate it and embrace it. And if you don't, I mean, just think about it. If, if I told you as a believer, I am created in the image of God, and you told me, well, no, you're not. And, you know, we would have an issue there that's pretty, yeah. pretty difficult to resolve. And that is kind of the level of magnitude that's been given to this self-determined identity where now if I, if I deny that you are a woman trapped in a man's body, for example, then that is perceived as something hateful. It's perceived as something where you are denying my very core being. And um, that's why the stakes quickly get elevated to this level that seems absurd. But um, it's, it's all wrapped up in this identity question of who we are. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And just to clarify, the book that Truman wrote was, and when I was in a pastoral ministry class, my professor took time out of the lecture before that book had come out to say, hey, you need you need to read this book. Mm-hmm. I, because I'm a seminary professor, was lucky enough to get an advanced copy, and you students need to read this book. And so I did. I got a group of guys together. Uh, all pastors, we took three months getting together uh, every other week to talk through it, and it was so helpful. But the shorter one you mentioned that I think has been so good is called Strange New World by Carl right. Truman. Yeah. So I highly yeah. recommend. And the lengthier one is The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Man. So. Two great titles. Yeah, they really are. They're helpful. And I was also helped by another guy named Christopher Watkin, who has written a book um, recently called, and this is um, another hot button topic, but it's called Biblical Critical Theory. Um, critical theory has received a lot of criticism, and rightfully so in some um, some contexts, but he kind of turns it around on itself, and um, he does a really helpful job of diagnosing our culture and talking about um, just the moment, again, that we are in right now. And, and that book has been really helpful for me, too. Oh, thank you so much. You know, I want people to get their money's worth out of the weekly. So uh, yeah. we, try to, we try to plug books. Yep. <laughs> yep. But I, so this week, you preached this sermon. You talked about the cost of noncompliance, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stand before the king. And I, in this polite non-anxious way respond to the volatility of Nebuchadnezzar and it was just you did such a great job walking through the emotional heights of this story and how these men trusting in God respond and then I went home this week and found and ended up finishing a podcast called the witch trials of JK Rowling Mm. which was just a story of how she has gotten embroiled in this conflict of human identity and what is and isn't a woman. She, not a Christian, getting involved because she identifies and has worked as a feminist for a long time, is getting into this, like, what really is a woman? How do we keep women's spaces safe? And has gotten a ton of pushback. I mean, most independent bookstores in Boulder don't carry her anymore. That 
she's been booed off campuses around the country and world. I mean, she is facing now. She's a multimillionaire who wrote one of the most. But aren't we all? I mean, come on, Patrick. <laughs> you're in the in the sense of scale. You're right, but I would say Rowling is in a little different category than you and I. No, fair. Great, fair. thank you. But even she has faced so much pushback yeah. for not complying on this issue just because of how she understands human nature. Yeah. Are there some encouragements you can give to, I mean, as we face this in our the lives of our family, our friends, our coworkers, are there some encouragements that you see in this story through the scriptures yeah. to how we can live non-compliantly? Yeah, so just as a little sidebar to continue down that path, you you point out somebody like J.K. Rowling. Um, you know, you can even you can look at another example too that I, I've come across recently in headlines, and that's um, Richard Dawkins of all people, who is you know part of um, a, a group of people who are, are very aggressively opposed to Christianity, um, to the Bible. Uh, yet there is a in a strange way, there is common ground on this issue of identity in some areas, not, not entirely, not a hundred percent for sure. But, um, Richard Dawkins has also received criticism because he has come out and said, no, there are only two sexes. There's male and female. And, wow. um, yeah, so it's just an interesting point, but the, the, you know, kind of underlying thing here is that, um, this is not exclusively an issue of faith. It's not exclusively an issue of Christianity and um, other views here. Mm-hmm. But um, obvi- obviously for the Christian, our faith, our perspective on this issue should be informed by what God's word tells us. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of the encouragement, um, I would just say it's in the text. Like the encouragement is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego they displayed this uncompromising faith, this uncompromising trust in God in the midst of fantastic pressure. Like it's because this has become such a children's story. I think it's easy to look down on it a little bit. We can't help but think of it in the context. And I I don't mean this um, just to get a laugh, but you know, it it is kind of the context of like the bunny of veggie tales and Shadrach, Rack, Shack and Benny. Um, like I said before, but those stories, you know, have been modified in order to present it to children. And we can, without even trying, we can almost look down and diminish the text a little bit and, and lose the fact that this was an actual historical event where the flames were real. The, the furnace was real and the pressure was real. And yet we see these men display an uncompromising trust in God. That's just incredible to me. And I, I can only um, just believe that this is a special work of God in their lives in that moment to be able to stand up to that pressure they faced and then to see how God met them in that moment and was faithful to them. Like that is what we have to grasp onto ourselves, trusting that God will supply the faith we need and um, for whatever moment we're in. And we, you know, often face consequences, circumstances that are not of the same magnitude as what these men faced. But even so, we face pressure in our day and we need to, um, you know, trust the Lord to provide us the faith that we will need in the moments that we will be in ourselves. So um, I, I just find that hope in the text. I see that guidance, that direction in the text. And it just makes me want to um, acknowledge where my faith is is weak, where my faith is lacking, and pray that the Lord would strengthen my faith so that I would stand up in that moment too, just like these men did. Mm. And even... I- As we're reading through the text this morning, I think of it's even a redemptive arc, like a type of Jesus story where these men, they face the consequence unto death for their, for their faithfulness to God. And then it's at the last moment 
yeah. God intervenes. Well, even it's not, it's it's kind of after the last moment yeah, that it's he intervenes in the, in the furnace, the moment where they should be dead already. Yeah. But God meets them in that moment by providing for them. Yeah. And we see this just supernatural deliverance and we have to trust mm. that that's not exclusive to these three men, but that's something that God does for all who trust in him. Now, it may not look the same. It may have a different outcome in the sense that our lives are not preserved on this earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually the story for most Christians that um, when you face that moment, God is going to deliver you through death, not from death. Um, however, he still is going to deliver you because he's faithful to do it. Oh, what a note to end on. That. That is just so sweet, Perry. Thank you so much for coming on this week, for talking about Daniel 3. I know this is a conversation you and I could just keep having, and that's what's so fun about it. But it's been so sweet to be able to just spend some time hearing your thoughts. You bet. More and more about this. And, hey, thanks for listening to The Weekly. We're so excited to invite you and the rest of Calvary into these conversations as we dive deeper into God's word, into who he says we are and what that means for our everyday lives. If you're interested in what's going on at Calvary, you can head over to calvarybible.com and you can hit your campus, go to your events and see all the great opportunities that are happening. And as always, we'll see you next week.